Bernard Gunther has had a lifelong interest in exploring the mysteries and hidden knowledge surrounding our planet and humanity's origins, questioning the root of what constitutes, quote, reality, and how social and spiritual conditioning impacts upon our collective search for the truth in all aspects of life. For more info on Bernard and an extended version of his bio, be sure to check out the show notes. In this episode, we discuss the necessity of the inner work, what inner work looks like, also referred to as shadow work, the balancing act of being aware of the darkness while not getting sucked into it or perpetuating it, both individually and collectively, and what Neil Kramer calls the, quote, second matrix as it relates to truthers and freedom fighters. I highly recommend checking out some of Bernard's articles at veilofreality.com. I find that what Bernard writes on his, his various articles reflects a lot of my inner dialogue as it relates to various balancing acts and, and, and traps we can find ourselves in as people who consider us ourselves to be, quote, awake, so to speak. I also recommend checking out his 14-week Time of Transition program, and you can find info on both the Time of Transition program and Veil of Reality uh, at the couple of links that we have listed in the show notes. Bernard really speaks so well to a lot of my own inner musings, and uh, I really enjoyed listening to him just sort of rattle off all of the his perceptions on a variety of topics. And you know, of, of course, as it always is, I don't agree with literally everything that he says, but nonetheless, I really appreciate how he thinks and, and the depth at which he thinks and, and his willingness to sort of be, be humble and admit where he is falling short, so to speak, and where he still has blind spots. And that's kind of what we go back and forth on in this episode and reflecting on his own experiences relating to the the larger quote truth and freedom movement and and where he finds aspects of how he was and currently is and what's going on with the truth or in freedom movement and it was really just an awesome conversation so i hope you enjoy it. i know i thoroughly did so without further ado here's the episode with bernard gunther So my parents, I mean, it's, it's a big uh, story. My dad escaped Eastern Germany, socialist Germany, you know, uh, back before the wall came wow. down, wow. met my mom in Germany. She escaped Poland. And then he fulfilled his dream. He came to the U S to go to UCLA, did his PhD there. And I was wow. born there while they were there. And then a year later, they moved back to Germany. So I got so you, you are an American citizen. I got citizenship out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you grew up in Germany? But I grew up fully in Germany. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I, I actually don't know this about you. I'm very familiar with your work, but I don't know your, your journey. Uh, I hate saying this. I hate saying it like this, but for lack of a better way to describe yeah. it, your journey of waking up. I guess your journey of becoming I got aware. It, yeah to the world and aware to yourself because you are very, very yeah. good at balancing out both, which I think will be largely the topics um, that we cover today. So yeah, just, yeah. just share your, your story to start. Well, in a nutshell, um, what's a continuum process awakening, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I think it started already in high school, just not being able to, I mean, the typical archetypal stereotypical loner, right? Not being able to fit in that kind of thing. Um, and growing up in Munich, Germany, uh, but 
similar to you when we just talked off camera, I was big into sports. I loved sports. I was big into so I was on the handball team too in the school, playing handball. So football, That's why I love soccer. talking to people from <laughs> Europe because at <laughs> least they know what handball is. They're like, hey, oh, it was wow. Fun, man. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas it's if very... I if I interview Americans <laughs> or talk with Americans, they're like, What what did you play? Is that a real sport? It's pretty intense sport handball, man. Like the <laughs> right. way that you know, trying to go through the you know, outside and all that. But no, I was in the swimming team, tennis team, football team. Like it just, you know, just physical. It was, I just loved it. And I was an average student, but I just couldn't, couldn't fit in. And, you know, I was a bit bullied, psychological bullying. So all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, but I was, I found refugee or like, you know, what helped me a lot to go th through childhood, you know, dealing with my emotional life because I was very sensitive was music. So just listening to music, just burying myself in it. And then, you know, I just went through high school, didn't know what to do in my life at all. And then I'm going to graduate in 1991 in high school. I met this friend and he introduced me to drums. I started playing drum late at my at the age of 18 or 19. And then I remember having this literary transcendental experience of just, wow, playing music and being physical at the same time. So it was kind of like the perfect match for me and expressing myself, especially back then I wasn't the heavy music, like heavy, dark music. Listening, I grew up on Metallica and all the kind of, you know, 80s rock bands, Guns N' Roses and all that. And I got into grunge, Soundgarden, uh, Alice in Chains, even Pantera, some metal, but just playing that music helped me to process a lot. It's almost like my first experience of quote unquote shadow work of just releasing like pent up emotions mm. right and then i felt like this is what i'm gonna do with my life because i at the same time i was already enrolled in a university of music to study business economics why because everybody else was doing that and in my mind still very plugged in well life is about making money so i have to study business like everybody else and go on with the program and da, da, da. and then but it, i remember sitting in the university of munich and I had the same feeling like in high school. I don't like this. What am I doing here? Right. But I just went with it just because I didn't know anything else until I met this friend. It was almost like divine intervention. And my whole life changed. I remember starting, I started playing drums, practicing eight hours a day. Boom. Right. And then we decided, him and I, to go to Los Angeles to the Musicians Institute, you know, one of the best drum schools and musician uh, schools out there. Uh, and I came to LA in 1993 or 1994 to study drums and percussion. That's what I did just full on. Um, that's what I want to do with my life. Absolutely. I focus on that. And even in my mind, if I don't make it by 20, uh, by the age of 27, I will kill myself, blah, 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 because right. I don't fit in. <laughs> I had this whole romanticized idea of music, right? So I played in bands in, in, um, in LA, played all the clubs, my friend, eventually went back but i kept pushing playing in bands got my own band together as well but within that i had a lot of disillusionment disillusionment with this whole idea of becoming a rock star and all of that being in la and the whole idea of you know all it's it's a lot of music business appearances and what what's really going on as opposed to a lot of toxic yeah. coping mechanisms exactly et cetera, et cetera. and i'm not used to it i grew up in europe you know and right. even like the superficiality i remember when i first came to the u.s the americans were greeting me like hey bernard how you doing how you doing and i'm like oh this person's interested in how i'm doing so i share about my life what i'm going through and like and Throwing off the person because this is not what you do, right? The socially right. correct way just is the thing to you have, say, how are you doing? And you're like, oh, good. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so you just answer. respond, Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Or you don't even answer the question. You answer with the same, how are you? But nobody really cares how you're doing. Right. <laughs> you know, so it is what it is. Uh, but I also enjoyed like there's more freedom uh, experience here as well compared to Europe. It's the heaviness of tradition and the old country and all of that. So definitely sparked my creative spirit, so to speak. Um, but with it, as I was playing drums, expressing myself, playing around, um, I was having a day job, just like a musician, right? But then I, more stuff came up for me, more depression, despair, you know, not, not just not feeling right. And I remember one day I woke up and I was working part time or just uh, had a day job at an animal hospital, uh, like animals and whatnot, just working back then seven hours, $7 an hours. 
I woke up like almost in a fetal position, crying. Like I've had dealing with so much depression, didn't know what to do. My music career wasn't going on. And I remember this voice, you got to figure yourself out. Otherwise you will die. You know, wow. you were going to kick myself out. You know, and figure I was also your, figure then. yourself out, not figure your life out, figure yourself no, figure out. yourself out. Wow. Exactly. Figure yourself out. Otherwise you're not going to make it like literally yeah. this voice, whatever that was. And I remember I went to this bookstore um, and then there was this book laying around by this. I remember I still, still have it, this face, like this Indian guy from, from the side, Krishnamurti. And the book was read him from the known. Mm -hmm. And I read that book and, and it was so profound to me. He's like, for me, like a spiritual anarchist in a sense, truth is a pathless land. You know, you know, there's no one who can show you, you know, the way out, so to speak. And there was one quote that stuck with me to this day. And there, there was, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And that was like, holy shit, that's what I'm trying to do. Like, I'm trying to adjust to something that is not in alignment with who I am, not alignment with nature, with God, divine, nothing. We're totally out of tune. And that was for me more the starting point kickoff, so to speak, right? Of quote unquote awakening to really like, who am I? What is life about? What's really going on? And that kind of opened up the door. But early and early on for me, it was also clear. And that's also reflected in my work right now that it's both the inner and outer work. So I needed to understand myself, my emotional self. I got early on a, into shadow work, Carl Jung. I started, started also in the 90s and just um, basic psychology, but also spirituality. And at the same time, what's really going on in the world, right? And then back then, also in the 90s, I came across uh, these... One of my uh, mushroom dealers <laughs> gave me a VHS tape back then. Naturally, you know, naturally, that makes naturally sense. Of, naturally, my mushroom dealer gave me a, a, a VHS tape of an eight-hour lecture of this guy called David Icke in the uh -huh. 90s. So that, that kind of like blew everything up, right? So that was introduction to the conspiracy world, so to speak. Right. Um, the Red started reading his books and tumbled down the rabbit hole, right? That was really the initiation. And I went deeper, did my own research and started, you know, that was way before social media, YouTube, even Google videos, all of that. That was, I had to read books, I had to read, watch VHS videos and all of that. And it started out and, you know, from that, that then take a, took a life on its own. And then during this time, it's interesting, my, my band kind of dissolved. And as I was working more on myself, I got deeper into uh, yoga, meditation. I got also introduced into all these practices and I found a new talent, new new gift all of a sudden, which was body work and massage. And one of my mentors appeared, one of my roommates, he was a professional body worker, yoga teacher, and introduced me to, to body work and massage. And I've experienced the healing abilities of receiving body work. The body-mind connection became, became so clear to me already back then that whatever emotion we suppressed is stored in the body and any disease we're also experiencing is also manifested in the body so it's all this holistic idea of the body mind health i experienced back then hands-on and i started then studying body work all kinds of modalities massage modalities energy work rolfing deep structural work deep body work and boom pursued that my life completely changed i established my own practice and did this work back and moved into topanga canyon outside la had my own private practice for 15 years uh, did that work and at the same time was still researching writing and then started writing actually out of just because it helped me to formulate my thoughts right and wow. i started back out in the days before there was facebook social media i started on on myspace <laughs> original myspace days just to find people i want to just write to see if better every anybody can you know re relate to that i want for people to talk to right and then I met some uh, guy, some friend through my space. And then he told me, hey, you should have a blog. And I'm back then, what is a blog? And then introduced me to WordPress back then. I'm like, okay, I'm going to start writing. So it really happened without wanting, without any ambition to be anything or something. I just out of the pure curiosity and helping me to write, to formulate my thoughts, to maybe connect to others. That's how I started writing. And then I found it another gift. Oh, I'm actually pretty good at writing. And have this ability to connect dots in my own way and all of that. So that took a life on its own. Um, and then over the years with my body work and my writings becoming more 
known, so to speak. People started contacting me, asking questions. So I um, started working with people one on one as well. Right. So that kind of moved into like a coaching business or just helping people process hands on as well with my body work, healing work, but also online. And at the same time, I was still researching, right? I got deeper, not only 3D conspiracies, but the alien topic, the occult forces, all of that, hyperdimensional matrix. I got heavily, I was heavily experimenting back then with psychedelics as well. I spent a lot of time in Peru, ayahuasca, deep in the jungle. I did a lot of DMT back in the days, all of that, like <laughs> mushrooms. I had, I, I did the whole chance McKenna thing, eating five grams, lock myself in the room and like, let's see, that's what happens, right? And I was just a psychonaut. I wanted to experience. I was experimenting with ketamine and all of that. Even had this whole folder, like scientifically approaching how to create a near-death experience with ketamine. I was just like, I, I want to understand what's going on, right? right. Like just being what are some What are some meta concepts you took away from those experiences? Well, that the fascinating thing, especially because I had all that deal with mushrooms or LSD, not, not too much LSD. It was mostly mushrooms I was working with a lot. Um, to have this spiritual experience and experience my oneness and all of that. But the most profound experience is that I entered this alien world with all these beings and entities. And then I realized, hold on, we are not alone. There's something else right outside our perception, the other beings forces interacting with us. Yeah. That like introduced it, it, etheric to... astral beings. Yeah, like exactly. The, like yeah. the machine elves, like uh, Terrence, Terrence McKenna talked about yeah. on DMT. There's something, but it was distinct. Some, conscious beings not my own projection of part of my mind i was communicating with right so that really opened up and i had even experience of all kinds of reptilian beings entities uh, and and there's a common thread from a lot of people who do these sort of psychonautic that's a word experiences with psychedelics where they see a lot of the same types of beings so that yeah. so it kind of indicates to me that there's a, a thread of commonality that makes it not so much a projection of the mind, but rather, I don't want to say a projection of of reality itself, but maybe actually distinct real beings that are just not within our conscious awareness on in day-to-day reality. Exactly. So that was uniform in, in many uh, other people. Ex- I, I, I was tripping with as well, so to speak. But I also then realized I was, you know, I was in desert parties. I did the whole trans thing, you know, before, you know, Burning Man, not never went to Burning Man. You're an OG burner before Burning Man became what it is Before even Burning Man started. We had our only legal parties out in Mojave Desert, took like generators out there and just ate a bag of mushrooms and they danced through the night. It was awesome, actually. (laughs) Like it was kind of like a rite of passage, which we're missing in this day and age too, kind of yeah. initiating me Monte Delta, just expressing myself, right? Uh, but with it, a lot of stuff came up. So I soon realized, okay, this is nothing to toy with, right? Um, mm. Because I had some quote unquote bad trips, which were also my own stuff just coming up. And then I realized, okay, I have to take it easy. I have to actually integrate what's going on. And I stopped doing the, using them recreational. I realized, okay, this is some serious stuff. Right. So then... I went to Peru, spent a lot of time in the jungle and in the Andes, also in the early 2000s, uh, working for Ayahuasca, Wachuma. So that was part of my medicine path back then. But at some point, I realized I had to lay it aside. There was too much coming on, my own childhood stuff, right? Unsuppressed trauma, uh, all of that. I had to integrate it more. I had to really work to do the work soberly, right? Yeah. Just do basic trauma work, somatic work, shadow work, and all of that. And... At the same time, I saw what's going on in the world. Then 2001, 9-11 happened for me right away. Okay, this is, you know, this can only be an inside job. So I tried to wake everyone up and and convince everybody with information alone and soon learn this is not the way to do it. Uh, you get just more attacked and, and all of that. So it needs a different approach. Yeah, put, putting more pe- people off with that approach. And that's that's the, yeah. I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but th- that's something that, um, I, I want to circle back to, let's just like, mm. like book note that one earmark that because I want to circle back as it relates to the truth or community now. And, and ultimately the approach is almost off putting in, in many ways to, um, in, in almost counterproductive in helping to quote, wake other people up. So to speak, yes. but let's earmark Absolutely. that one and turn back to it. Yeah. And also what I mean back then I can understand it because you like, out of you not only 
you see something nobody else is, and you want like, can you just see this? Right. You know, it comes, it comes from a well-meaning intention. So I have compassion totally for that. Does. I've been there too. Yeah. It's absolutely well-meaning intention, but it can easily then become toxic, especially you're not engaged in the inner work. And that's very less because then my I would project my shadow on others. I would put others down, right? And then not really understand came to my own realization that, okay, this informational awareness of what is a PSYOP or what government is corrupt and all this nonsense we're being lied to, this informational awareness is not a true awakening, right? right? That's the whole thing. We talk about this word awakening, which is completely abused because the true awakening is on an esoteric spiritual level to union with the divine, to come, you know, connect your true self essence beyond this ego structure and have not nothing short of enlightenment and i'm certain certainly not awake in the true meaning of the word totally it's a process yeah. there's a certain yeah. awareness that comes right um but i've also noticed especially as i got deep in my inner work that i used conspiracy and everything that's going on in the world as a distraction to deal with my own stuff you know i just <laughs> tweeted that this morning Oh, that, yeah? I don't know. I didn't know. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> oh, now I want to read to you just because it's relevant exactly what I had tweeted this morning yeah. because it it is so spot on with what you just said. I said, I used to get a lot more engagement on this platform when I was largely hyper fixated on what, quote, they are doing and largely blaming, quote, them. Mm -hmm. I realized much of it was a means of distracting myself with what's happening, quote, out there to avoid confronting and addressing what's happening inside of me. I'm mm -hmm. realizing that much of the truth or in freedom community is lost in a perpetual cycle of victimhood, disempowerment, and avoidance. I'm learning yeah. that in order to bring about real change out there, it requires that each of us does the work to take full ownership of our own thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and actions, because we are helping to co-create this reality. We are constantly building our future. So what part are we playing in helping, quote, them bring about what, quote, they want by avoiding? Yeah, exactly. Well said. And it's a journey because I have done, I, 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 I get triggered. I project. I'm not always aligned. Same, you know, same. I get annoyed. I can I can be self-righteous. I have my own arrogance. And I can see all of that, what I blame others to be in myself as well. I can own that, right? I'm on the journey myself, even more so in the past. I was even like, even with this whole Palestine-Israel thing that's happening nowadays, all of a sudden everybody's Palestine activists, right? And and so that's amazing. And you know, and speaking out against Israel, Zionism, but it's also, as you may know, has kind of been hijacked by the woke left, and it's kind of like this weird, you know, you know, we're being programmed to react in a certain way. I was a full-on uh, pro-Palestine supporter back in the day, this was a 10 years ago, you know, painting my Palestinian flag on my face, going to the federal building, protesting in LA and all of that, speaking out Zionism is terrorism and all of that. And now all the kids get on my case. Why do you not speak out against Palestine? You should speak about this and that. And like, I've been there, done that, you know, just because of whatever you post it on, on, um, on social media regarding uh, pro-Palestine or peace and, and, and ceasefire and all of that, it's not going to do anything. They are trying to get an emotional reaction out of you, right? right? And I also realized it is, it is going back to the, the activism thing, I also realized within myself the reason why I was so identified with the Palestinian cause and standing up for the victim is, again, distracting from my own stuff, right? And I'm not saying that there's atrocities not being held, but it's way more complicated, but I've seen a lot of People, I remember I had this epiphany when I was one of the protests in LA, pro-Palestine uh, protests. It was 2004, five, I remember. I went there and I had this epiphany I'm around these people, like these hippies, everybody's smoking joints. And it's just it's like nobody, can, every, it's just a social event. And people are there like just sitting there or just screaming. But what are you doing with your life? What's really going on? And I realized that people do this out of their own shadow projections, out of their own trauma, um, you know, to identify with the victim. And it is actually a mechanical reaction that is, they're trying to make themselves feel better by standing up for something, but eventually don't care really, right? This is very, it's very psychologically weird. So I realized, no, no, this is not, this is not how it works. We need to become the change deeper. We need to work within ourselves and have a, 
shift in consciousness because this externalization is not working, right? right? We, we just fall into, you know, maybe you've heard of this drama triangle, victim, perpetrator, and rescuer, right? Always going around, around, around. And the victim blame trap, I realized this is the big matrix program that we always, we're the victim or we victimize somebody else. And there's a perpetrator and this comp always this very superficial approach trying to fix the world externally, right? But ultimately as within, so without. So as I saw two different um, groups or approaches, so to speak. On one hand, you know, I was deeply involved in the spiritual communities, spiritual people. I I dipped in the new age a little bit too, right? right. <laughs> and we all take the new age pill at some point and had to get out of it a little again. Yeah, that's the uh, perfect description. You take <laughs> so it and you're doesn't like, work. there's some things about this that are kind of cool that I'll take with me yeah. a little bit, but a lot of this yeah. is escapism. Exactly. So it's it's not black and white. Mostly like the whole idea, just don't focus on 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 the on the bad, just be positive, right? right. This oversimplified approach. Um, and I saw a lot of people even engage in inner work, even psycho-spiritual work, but they had no clue what's going on in the world. We right. saw this specifically over the past four years with you know what happened, right? Uh, a lot of people who seemingly supposedly be aware went along with the whole COVID thing and all of that. Right. Um, but then on the other side of the coin, especially over the past few years, I've seen in the so-called truth movement, right? Which I see it's great. More people are becoming aware, but they have, they, I can see clearly how so many people project their own stuff onto the world. They have no self-awareness. They get easily triggered, project and all of that. No, any inner work, no understanding of shadow work, no all of that. And then again, in any, in any inner work. So that's kind of almost the, the issue we're dealing with. I think we need to do both in and out of work together. It's not either or, right. right? And that's the key point. And it's a process. And as I go deeper into my also special spiritual work, also having the humility to see that, you know, there's something bigger happening, which I may have no understanding of. I don't know where it's all leading to. Hmm. Even this very rigid idea of what is good and bad, evil, and black and white. And, you know, especially... Over the past few years, this idea of controlled op and shill and psyop is being uh, thrown around like candy and in a very oversimplified manner, which again, I've done this myself. Let's say I have too. Absolutely. You know, quick, quick example Elon Musk. I literally wrote an article about him 10 years ago. He is the Antichrist and technocratic, you know, uh, sh wolf in sheep clothing. He's going to take over the world and usher us in the transhumanism age and all of that. And I still see him as a, yeah, he's probably, he's definitely pro AI and transhumanism. He's an atheist. He is, you know, uh, DMC seem very spiritual. He's helping so to roll out agenda. millimeter wave technology all over the world. Exactly. There's, there's a lot of like. Neuralink, absolutely. But, but, but I think the, the, the general point is like, are we in his psyche? Do we know for sure, certain that he isn't just under the presupposition that these things are good and that this is the, like, does he actually have malicious intent? Can we know that? Exactly. Exactly. So I think from his perspective, he thinks this is a good thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, with you, people can argue one way or the other, what happened with Turton, the way he speaks out, like he doesn't have to do that, right? He speaks some, okay, there's some truth in what he says. So my views has have become way more nuanced, not that black and white, you know, because I don't know what this role, this what role this person plays. And it's not, you know, I've been called... Uh, shill, psyop, controlled up. I mean, over the years, uh, Illuminati, <laughs> agent, and all of that. So I knew how easily people label other people, right? But I see it more, what's the role really? You know, even the role of evil, when you look at it, is so paradoxical. Because what I've seen, and I'm sure you have seen it even in you, right? In your life, you can see it in yourself and many others, with this attempted enslavement over the past four years, it did trigger an awakening. Right. right. It right. forced us to focus on what truly matters. It forced you to become motivated at what you're creating with the health freedom movement and all of that. And, and beyond the COVID and all of that, it, it asks us, what is health? What is allopathic medicine? Do we really need vaccines? Period. So a lot right. of people start asking these questions, which is the irony of it all. So it's almost from a spiritual perspective, that's the rule or the teaching lesson of, of, of quote unquote evil that it, it is like the pathogen and the remedy at the same time, because it helps us to become more aware, to use the friction 
for the work to become aware not only on the information level, but also look internally within ourselves how we can uh, come into more alignment with who we truly are. You said so many things there that I want to touch on that I, you know, that I agree with, like, oh man, I, I want to circle back to the Israel Palestine thing, because what you mentioned where people feel called to speak out on that for what may be, you know, benevolent intentions, right? Like raise awareness to what's going on over there. I yeah. think there was a piece of me that was absolutely doing that, which is why I spoke out initially is I was projecting my own internal anger surrounding some situations I'm dealing with with family onto the Israel-Palestine situation. And at the same time, that situation is objectively, you know, I'll, I'll say it like this. I started speaking on it because I saw how much of the quote freedom movement was being captured to cheer for Israel and cheer for yeah. what is objectively a genocide occurring in Gaza. But then I abruptly stopped speaking about it because I'm like, am I having any actual positive impact on the situation by engaging in it in this way? And then I've yeah. really come to the conclusion over the past several months um, that the the biggest impact I can have is by doing the work, the necessary work to be in alignment in my thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and daily actions. Like that doesn't yeah. mean I'm not going to draw attention to what's going on in the world. If there's an injustice or sort of discuss these meta concepts that can apply to, you know, very generally to a broad group of people. Like I've been saying things like how I, I perceive the right to be just as much of snowflakes as the left are because the right is so emotionally manipulated by anything that the left does any yeah. headline yeah. that they put out and it's it's super ironic but but the point being is like my whole shtick if you will is now to turn people back to understanding that we are extremely powerful we are co-creating this reality together and whether you recognize that or not quote, they, whoever they are, do. And they are acutely aware that the best way to pre prevent the freedom movement from gaining any traction is to keep the freedom movement perpetually looking outside of themselves for saviors, yeah. one, perpetually looking outside of themselves by pointing to everything that, quote, they are doing, focusing on it, therefore perpetuating it with their own co-creative capacity, and prevent the freedom movement from recognizing the uh, the power of their thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and actions to co-create the reality that they want. Yeah, that's how it works. The uh, the whole matrix setup in the sense is they hijack our creativity. First of all, they don't want people to be creative. They want people to be copycats of copycats, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they numb them down with drugs, social media. Even That's a whole other issue of nowadays people ha have a hard time focusing their attention span goes low and lower like you know because in order to make something in life you need to have ability to be discerning to be able to say no to stay focused concentrated right and mm -hmm. tap into your creative potential but it's exactly like you said they also it goes even based on divine or cold laws or natural law they need our permission in a sense to en enslave us so to speak right mm -hmm. it's a trap of agreement but they're hijacking our creativity to create their desired reality through us, right? That's kind of it, like what you just said in a sense. And hence with the polarization, divide and conquer. That's the old, old game. We know that as well, right? Mm -hmm. And especially with the Palestine, you know, there's also other forces. That's why I go deeper because most people are focused on this 3D aspect of right. the, the quote-unquote matrix governments, whatever, then all the beat Zionists or the Illuminati or whatever they focus yeah. on secret societies, the Rothschilds. It's just, for me, they're all just puppets themselves controlled by other forces that have in other realms that have been given different names throughout the ages. And there are certain beings that feed off of that friction, that polarization, that's literally food with them, that level of consciousness, right? And I see also from a basic Jungian perspective, like how the left projects on the right and the right projects on the left right? Their own unconscious shadow. It's a shadow dance completely. And um, 
Yeah, you can maybe argue that the conservatives are a bit more level-headed to a degree, but both are lost in their own, you know, you see these both extremes arising. Right. And um, yeah, Michael Tessario, I'm sure you've heard of him. Yeah, he I knew you were going to either bring up him or David Whitehead. You, you had to <laughs> with where we were going. <laughs> I love David too. He's awesome. Uh, because Michael Tessario, he had a great point. Like somebody asked him years ago, like, you know, with this whole leftist, you know, wokeism, there's a counter reaction of the conservative movement, but there will also be more truly right wing, hardcore white supremacist movement arising as well by the concept of projective identification, which is a young concept that kind of you by identifying or with one side or fighting another side to an extreme, you become the other extreme over mm -hmm. time, right? That's literally what's happening. And I've seen the same. By the way, the main, one of the main reasons I stopped getting into this whole Palestine-Israel thing because I went down the rabbit hole, right? Because in really to understand the Israel-Palestine conflict, it's not like what happened first for years. You have to go back 50 years. You have to go back 100 years. You have to understand World War II, World War I, the Balfour Declaration, all of that, everything. Even beyond that, too, because really beyond that, biblical you got a question. Right. exactly yeah. Yeah. it's insane and then what happened what you know it's and who's what is truly a jew and all of that and right. then you got a question world war ii world war one and that opens up a rabbit hole and i totally agree that you know the uh, history has been written by the victors and there's a lot of questions to be asked but then you go some people go to such an extreme that hitler is all of a sudden the good guy now Right. Right. Absolutely. Or that and all I'm, Jews blanket statement are bad. All Jews, exactly. Right. There's true Jew hatred out there. I've seen that, right. you know, and, and all Jews and, and they get fixated on that and they're hijacked by, right. in that sense. And then you just, you just, the matrix has you and it's, it's not healthy. And uh, that's why like, you know, that's, I think what they're trying to do to get us cornered, to identify with certain beliefs and polarize each other more and more. Um, that's why I also see this awakening process is a complete individual process. Yes, we can have our movements, you know, and all of that and, 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 and reach people, but ultimately it is a deeply individual process that depends on many, many factors. And if we do not truly engage in the inner work and by inner work, I don't mean just contemplating and meditating. I, I mean, really psycho spiritual work. This is key because psychological work alone is, is, you know, and you end up in childhood basically, and they blame your parents or something. Right. Or you just do talk therapy, which your intellect can fool you that you have awoken, but you're just intellectualizing the process, you know, which I did for many years too. And then, and was lying to myself that I'm more like that I'm not because I intellectually knew all my childhood issues and my you shadow. You think that's why you got interested in body work for the somatic release aspect of trauma? Exactly. I think that's guided me there, especially. German mind, right? So very head centric. <laughs> Same. And help with the process. Also, I had to get into my body and I realized yeah. somatically release and, and experience a lot of emotions. I would just intellectualize away or dissociate away. Yeah. But then also the spiritual aspect. It is about special nowadays bringing God back into the picture. Mm -hmm. Your relationship to the divine, the higher power. It's absolutely necessary, like a spiritual science, because that's both the left is completely atheist, rejects the divine. And the right conservative, yeah, they have an, um, maybe a religious impulse, but there's also, from my perspective, a very disturbing, archaic, medieval, dogmatic Christianity resurfacing that claims that everything, anything that is not Christian is demonic. Like, right. I, oh my gosh. You know, I've yoga had people, is demonic, meditation is demonic. <laughs> like, I've had people cancel their memberships with my organization because we were having one of my friends who's a Sikh yogi teach Kundalini Yoga. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, that's why I'm saying I see this a lot too. And I think there's a natural impulse from the bigger picture of, of driving people to God, to find God, the divine. But then it's a trauma response as well. You know, my wife, Laura, and I, she talks, we do this work together. She's by the great way, too, by the way. way. I so appreciate yeah. her work and what she has. Yeah, to say. Awesome. You both are incredible. incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. But she has a good point, especially with the Christian thing. It's also a trauma response. Right. It's literally, it's no different than it's the needing to take on a spiritual identity. It ties into spiritual bypassing. Some people take the new age pill and become star seeds or, you know, whatever they think they are. Right. Like think they're channeling aliens or speaking light language. Exactly. Right. And then the other side of the coin, they all of a sudden become reborn Christians and Jesus saved them and all of that. Right. 
And you see, even now this, we had even a caught podcast episode literally called the new age to dogmatic Christian pipeline. A lot of ex new ages become now reborn Christians, but there's two sides of the same coin. You're just switching your identity and it's still a trauma response, right? Needing to grasp on to identify with something, but never looking within and facing your own pain and trauma, which you're running away from and which you try to put like a bandaid on by identifying with something, right? And I'm not I'm not denouncing Christianity. I have studied esoteric Christianity. There's a lot of truth in the Bible. If you understand yeah. the esoteric concept and the inner work in all of that, but um, you know, you have to have a certain mind to even be able to understand scripture and how that what it really means instead of turning this into a dogma and, and judgment and completely misusing it. And right. let's not forget or or any organized religion over the centuries have become very distorted and used for social engineering control as well. Mm -hmm. Christianity is not exempt from that. So I see there's almost this, yeah, the very dangerous medieval Christian movement happening as well, which, you know, I want to distance myself from too as well. But what we really need is to rediscover our own personal relationship to God, to the divine, whatever you may want to call it. That's not a prescribed key. approach. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not yeah. that there are not useful paths that have been paved via various teachings and practices that mm -hmm. give you direct access to the divine, but it's, it's not adopting a prescribed dogmatic approach and thinking that you must fit yourself in this box in order yeah. to access the divine. You really, I don't want to, I don't necessarily think you have to carve your own path, so to speak, but you have to choose your own path. And that may look like that you adopt one of these deeply ancient esoteric or, or metaphysical traditions that access the divine, but it also may not be. May that you yeah. literally be that you literally carve your own, but it's all based on you having to choose and and find what, for lack of a better term, resonates with you to access the divine on your own accord. Exactly, exactly, and also what that really means within yourself, and not even. I mean, I've studied all kinds of traditions, Sufism. You know what I mean? Laura, my wife, she's deep into Tibetan Buddhism. Mm. Um, I'm also very much in, have gotten deep into uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother's work of integral yoga over the mm -hmm. past, uh, you know, 10 years, very profound uh, work um, based on the old Veda teachings and all that. But even Sri Aurobindo, he made a good point, whom I personally consider after reading his work was the last avatar incarnated on this planet, right? The true ascended master and people can judge for themselves, but I highly recommend reading his work to get understanding because his life is very fascinating just on a side note because he grew up uh, in England his dad brought to England he grew up uh, uh, made even his degree in Oxford you know his first 20 years he spent in England in the west and he was extremely intelligent and then he realized what's going on you know that was around the uh, turn of the century what's going on in india and the colonization and the uprising of the nationalists so he went back to india in his early 20s and became literally a revolutionary like almost an anarchist revolutionary wow. organizing uprisings and 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 fighting the the english uh, you know colonists and all of that and to the point that he even ended up in prison he was imprisoned in india and into solitary confinement and that's where he found his yoga. Then he uh, started his own practice, taught himself all the his, his own cultural teachings, basically, and had an enlightening experience and founded his own integral yoga. So from this revolutionary activist, he became this enlightened master. And his work of integral yoga was very fascinating because he also went against all, even the, the esoteric or the, the yogi traditions of the East of it's not about escaping life. It's not about going down on the Himalayas or the Maya. It's not about uh, being raptured into heaven and 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 just or not about trying to become a light body by meditating in a cave. Forever. Exactly, none of yeah. that. No, we need to be here in life, activate in and spiritualize our bodies and the world and be active and in, engage in this miracle here on life because we're in the process. We're in the process of of bringing the divine into ourselves and into the onto this planet on this mm -hmm. earth so to speak and spiritualize it via this inner work right and then you know that's the whole transformation we're in and that's a possibility right now it's a strong possibility it's an opportunity for that 
But he also made a really good point that you should never get attached to scripture, whatever the scripture may be, right? It can be helpful on the path, like you said, but the divine works in a mysterious way. Even nowadays, on the positive note, you see that as well, the I see this, there are amazing new modalities, psychospiritual modalities, somatic modalities that help us to become on alignment of our true self, true essence that help us heal, right? I remember 15, 20 years ago, nobody talked about trauma, right? Nobody talked about even I remember you and think you talked about um, you know how to raise a child nowadays and, and against authoritarian programming, even childbirth and all of that, and all these modalities we have access to, which for me are also manifestation of the divine, even like similar to the esoteric teaching, but more geared towards our mind in these times, right? So we have to understand this is how the divine works. We need to, we don't have to go back all these ancient teachings and all of that because new teachings always emerge you know through amazing channels so to speak i'm not right. meaning new age channels but people right. who right. provide amazing work right? right and one modality i uh, i work with in our programs is very helps a lot is ifs internal family systems this is one of yeah. the most amazing really psycho spiritual modalities that really helps us to come on in alignment dealing with the different exiles the wounded parts but are connecting to self our true essence in many other ways, right? And uh, people are doing incredible work. So it's not about getting going back to the past. That's how, that's my issue I have with this whole cons conservative movement. It's like this trad movement, you know what I mean? Everybody wants their trad wife now all of a sudden, like <laughs> this manosphere, I don't know, uh, to see what's going on there. And, and yeah. I understand it's a complete re um, knee-jerk reaction to the woke left with the feminism and the destruction of family. And now all of a sudden they want to hold tight. And now, you know, all of a sudden the 50s were the best days ever, right? right. Wife be in the kitchen man be the provider and all of it's that it's like were were the 50s really the best days ever exactly. i'm not gonna i'm not gonna disagree <laughs> that in some respects that was it it was better right like i, I wouldn't yeah. disagree with that but in many ways it was also pretty shitty too yeah yeah like, and i think i think it's i th there's something to be said about roles right of 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 true masculinity femininity but it needs to evolve it needs to go beyond that right. you know and if you don't have the inner work you know, I've heard people say, if if you as a man think you have an inner feminine, you're just demasculated, right? And and all this nonsense, like this polarity movement and all of that, right? Um, but the, for me, the way I see it, this is just lack of anima animus integration based on Jungian work, right? The alchemical marriage of the inner male and female. And and still there are masculine roles and feminine roles, absolutely. But we need to evolve. We need to become integral beings within ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's the key point. And I also believe we all have something unique to contribute, to step into our power, right? In our creative ability, like what you do, for example. You know, I'm, I'm, I read recently that uh, you announced you have working on a whole... Um, practitioner database. Practitioner database, that's awesome. We need this nowadays because what I see, it's so important with Laura and myself, we, we have our like 14-week uh, coaching program about its soul awakening, which we guide people through for 14 weeks, two or three times a year. And a lot of people that join us, they're disillusioned mm -hmm. with their practitioners, right? They don't know what, who to go to, be it, be it medical doctors or even with psychotherapy and all of that. Because unfortunately, the therapy space has also been hijacked by the woke left. They right. cannot trust them anymore. They don't know what they, to talk to, right? And then you have the right even like Candace Owen recently posted, that therapy is nonsense and like th throwing completely throwing out the baby with the bathwater, yeah. right? Because they have the knee-jerk reaction to the left. So there are a lot of people who need this work, but also waking up, but they don't know where to go to, right? right? That's why we need to provide them with more resources where we can really unify all of that and people make their own choices based on what they need and people are not afraid to speak their mind. Right, because I've seen so many people they're afraid to have like the wrong opinion when they mention to their therapist about what's going on in the world. It's insane. Right. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider sharing it with at least one friend or family member who you think could benefit from hearing it. You help us grow and reach more people by sharing it with those around you. Also, be sure to head to the show notes to check out our membership offerings, membership marketplace, and more. 
We all know that big ag is poisoning our food supply and big pharma's so-called medicine is straight up poison. What most people aren't aware of though is that most supplements are also filled with artificial sweeteners, dyes, GMOs, glyphosate, and a host of other toxic ingredients, even many of the more natural supplements. My good buddy James Benefico dedicated his life to crafting the world's cleanest, most nutritious organic supplements after a pre-workout energy drink caused heart palpitations so severe that he almost landed up in the ER. Organic Muscle was born, revolutionizing sports nutrition by using exclusively non-GMO ingredients from USDA organic farms. Since then, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have leveled up their fitness and their health with Organic Muscle's award-winning natural pre-workout. There's no jitters, no heart palpitations, no itchy skin, just nourishing organic food and herb-based ingredients for clean, sustained energy, strength, endurance, and recovery. Numerous studies have shown that Tonka Ali is the most effective herb in the world for naturally boosting testosterone levels. And we know that testosterone levels are depleting all over the world because of what's put in the food supply, what we're exposed to, Organic Muscle has the world's first fully organic Tonka Ali supplement. I only support and promote things that I actually use and I can say I legitimately use Organic Muscle products. Use code FORWARD15 at checkout for 15% off at organicmuscle.com. I want to circle back to some micro, uh, or I guess I could say it's either micro or macro, these, these sort of concepts that we see play out on the individual level that we also see play out on the collective. As an example, yeah. the, the balance between, because how do, let me articulate this as best I can. It's like the new age constantly ignores what, quote, they are doing, just like mm-hmm. the new age, and this is you know very general, constantly ignores the shadow aspects of themselves right on an individual level they ignore also what's going on in the world and it's oh it's all love and light which allows the darkness to fester in the background but on the flip side of things what i would say the 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 truther black pill crowd is perpetually focused on what they are doing to where they sort of take on aspects of them or help perpetuate it by giving their co-creative capacity to them Likewise, I wouldn't say this is attributed to like the black pill crowd necessarily, but there is an aspect of people who are just caught in a perpetual trauma cycle where they can only see their trauma. They become their trauma. They're hyper-focused on their trauma. So I just, I want to get your thoughts on how we, we balance that out both on the individual level and then as we as individuals approach reality in the collective. Yeah. That's a great question, a big question. Um, I mean, I'm still struggling myself. Certain days, I have to be honest, you know, I I look at what's going on. I'm like, fuck, you know, like, I want to just <laughs> say something. Like, Same. It's so hard. It's so hard not to. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like, you know, I, I have my own things going on. So um, I can be very fiery. I have to choose my battles wisely. Right. But what yeah. I can say from personal experience, the key point of inner awareness the inner work is to become more self-aware. So what it means when it becomes certain information, let's recognize how this information affects you, what's really going on. That's true self-awareness without just acting. And I think the key point, we need action too, right? It's not, you know, people say, you know, claim that I, when I talk about, oh, just surrender to the divine, do inner work, like that, that this implies non-action. This is not true. Even Sri Yobinus said surrender to, to the divine is an active process. You give yourself to the divine. You need to have your whole body, mind, spirit alignment healthy to, to do the action, right? That right, is, to, you know, to have the divine flow through you appropriately to exactly. do the right action that is aligned. Exactly. Like the mother would say, his, his, uh, you know, she said, like, you have to have a will first to give to the divine before you can align with divine will. And that requires, as she said, con- being able to concentrate with effort, with focus and all of that. Mm-hmm. So that's very important. But the key point is differentiating mechanical action versus conscious action. Yeah. And most people act mechanically. What, what I mean by mechanically? Their unconscious drives, their triggers, their mommy-daddy issues are projected externally, right? Um, uh, you see this, obviously, the left... Uh, uh, 
generally speaking, have a lot of daddy issues. The right have a lot of mommy issues, and right. like just in a very super general sense, right? Um, but becoming more aware of that, that's the key point where I'm acting from, right? And that's what going back to IFS, internal family system, there's this concept of sub-personalities, right? That blend with you, that take you over. And the question is, what I is actually acting? What I is taking over, right? At any given moment. And even from the esoteric tradition, Gurdjieff talked in his fourth way, which is also based on esoteric Christianity, he took this arbitrary number. We have all these 987 different eyes mm. that act at any given time, but none of that is the true self. Who's What is the true self acting? Because sometimes when I become more aware, even within my relationship, you know, conflict in relationship triggers or happens anytime or in everyday life, I can see how all of a sudden the little Bernard, the inner child, the wounded, angry part comes up and takes over, right? Mm -hmm. Because of something that happened back in childhood, literally. Um, that once it's revenge and, and and not good enough and and fuck you and all that. You know? yeah. Or then the I'm not good enough program, the people pleaser comes up, the other side, right? To not being able to make boundaries, not stating your truth and all of that. So just to be, being able to become aware of that helps us to navigate this more where we can act from our true self. And what is our true self? That is more an embodied sense where you really, um, it's hard to put into words, right? There are certain aspects of the true self when you feel really grounded and embodied and you're also not even attached to what's going on in the world. Right. That's a key point, being able to see what's going on, but not being affected by it, not to the point that you just, Deny this it. So yeah, it's not this, this is like, oh, whatever, right? No. But okay, there's it's something subtle. It's, it, 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 there's a there's a subtle difference. It's not disassociated. It's a very it's, subtle it's, difference, right? And it, it, it's it's accepting it, and it's not even to say that you don't feel or or you know feel emotions associated with it. It's just that you don't get stuck in them, and you. I, I think what you're pointing to is the subtle, very brief pause in awareness of oh. I feel this way, like being yes. able to to observe that, oh, I feel this way before taking further action. Yeah. Like, yeah. you you know, you mentioned getting triggered by your partner. Same thing happens with me and my wife. And I'm really yeah. learning that when we're getting in an argument, I feel this urge to start reacting in a certain yes. way, yes. rather than briefly pausing, taking notice of what sensations I'm experiencing in my body and and sort of contemplating on why do I feel like that? Yeah. What well, what does it remind me of? Right. right. Because it yeah. usually comes back to the past, something, right? right? Absolutely. That's the essence of shadow work and a child work and all of that. But the it, it's very tempting because in order to when you react, this release, when they project, it gives you release. It's like almost a dopamine hit. Right. right? And from an occult perspective, actually some other forces feed off of that, what, <laughs> right. what, what I call luge, something feeds off this projection, this, yeah. and we see this a lot on Twitter, Twitter is like a lot of outrage porn, right? Oh my God, that and is I, literally that's, the that's, best that's, description of Twitter. That's what Twitter <laughs> is nowadays. It's so interesting because I know you're on multiple platforms too. That, like yeah. that <laughs> describes the Twitter crowd versus <laughs> exactly. like Instagram. It's it, uh, it tends to be people who I would say are less aware of some of the depth of the darkness that is occurring in the yeah. world, but also yeah. tend to be more loving, kind, and open. And it's not that yes. it's better because again, Instagram people are less aware, but, yeah. but relative yeah. to Twitter, they're much more kind and loving like Twitter. It's exactly. Like, I mean, yeah, I like Twitter. You get special if I have to, you know, since Elon Musk, you get some good information. It's very interesting. Right. But can get overwhelmed with information. Like you said, like people are, you know, you can make, People make money with outrage porn and clickbait nowadays because of the ad revenue and all of that's a whole other story, right? Uh, but the, one of the biggest things I had to learn, especially I can be, you know, some people have conflict phobic, right? And like people be in all of this and don't want to say anything. I have the opposite. I don't shy away from conflict. I had to choose my battles very wisely because I'm like, and then, you know, it can be very confrontational and it's just my own stuff sometimes. I had to learn. Uh, from Robert Greene. I don't know if you heard of him. The, no, I have uh, 48 not. Law, uh, the 48 Laws of Power. Oh, wait. Is it sure an orange maybe you've book? About it. Is it an orange and blue book? I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I think so. so. It's really fascinating. Uh, but he also, you know, he gives some, you know, rules for life, so to speak. But especially in the impulsive person, whatever message you get, whatever you read and you feel the respond, wait 24 hours. 
way too it's it's not easier said than done <laughs> you know unless it's like you got to reply to something that's kind of like a very pressing, important right, issue right. but not, not there's never a pressing issue to on on social media to reply or post something right away right mm-hmm. so i noticed like even like my wife law she reminds me of that like hey you're a bit activated right now just write it all out put it in the folder and look at it tomorrow again mm-hmm. that's been the best advice you know and sometimes i still just go you know reactively but it's helped a lot then i can tell you 80 percent of the times of what i was going to post i don't even post mm. or talk because i just hold on there was this is, that's that's not, that doesn't make sense it doesn't help anything it's you know or i change it and and something else comes in so for example that helps and also to process it as well and especially nowadays the like mentioning the the black pill i mean we had a whole episode on this black pill. Everything is a cyber. Everybody's a psyop. Psyops everywhere. Every everything is a trap, right? The world is going to shit. And I have to say, because I've been in this quote unquote game for a long time, I've heard about the economic crash and everything going to shit for over twenty years. <laughs> all the predictions I have heard it all, including all the savior predictions. Finally, the cabal the FEMA will be camps. taken they're out. They're coming. Oh, they're coming. The FEMA Just camps. Wait. I've heard them. Alex Jones screaming about the FEMA camp since the nineties, literally. Right. So <laughs> right. I've heard it all. I've seen it, even the, all the savior things. I've heard them all. You know, the cabal was supposed to be arrested already in 2012 by the Galactic Federation of Light. Somehow <laughs> it happened. I've heard it all. Right. Right. So I've, there's one, two things people cling to is hope and fear. Mm. We need to go beyond them. Neither hope nor fear, which is either said than done because the, our ego person wants to grasp to one or, or the other. But all we can do is one at a time, especially nowadays, we are in a psychological warfare, psy warfare, absolutely, with the information overload. So we need to also be very mindful of what information we expose ourselves with, right? Um, not to deny it, ignore it, but we almost not never meant to have access to so much information and interaction, mm-hmm. right? Especially people like us, we are more in the public, so we get a lot of interaction projections oh engagements all of yeah. that right if you don't reply in time like oh, don't know who you think you are yeah <laughs> and all these kind of things right so it's luckily just, i i, it's I have two kids so i have a really really good fallback <laughs> excuse for everything oh sorry i didn't yeah, reply exactly. for three weeks because i'm with my kids but it's just also like um what's happening in your everyday life right even right. our program and go people through the people ask us those kind of questions you know, ask the question, is this really necessary? What do I need to do? Uh, you know, what do I need to focus on right now one step at a time? Because the more you're really grounded within yourself, that's what I really, people don't understand. Um, and, and, and more connected to self and know your different parts in your psyche and have worked through your trauma and your shadow and act more in, in a high alignment, you have way more powerful effect on the world than somebody just, you know, reacting and just posting and trying to wake up people of information and screaming at the world. A truly conscious being based on soul power has way more effects one than 1 million people who are just, you know, reactively typing on Twitter that, you know, just in a general sense. And that's the hardest for us to grasp because we are so externalized everything, mm-hmm. right? It's literally like the Plato's allegory of the cave, people mesmerized by the shadows on the wall. Right. And that's, we're doing shadow dancing and that's what other forces feed upon. We keep in this perpetual loop. Um, but I also know, you know, the way I always say, I see it in my own life, you know, after all the rabbit holing you do down the conspiracy rabbit hole and fringe and try to figure it out at some point, if you don't get lost in it, because I've seen people getting lost in it over the years, man, for some people, it's not healthy to get into this conspiracy stuff. Then, you know, their, their own constitution makes them even more psychotic. Um, but once and, you do is that, that kind of what you refer to in some of your writings with the second matrix? Because I, I want to, I, yeah. I think that's a good that's segue I, into, into this topic because exactly. So that's kind of what Neil Kramer. Can you, can you describe what you mean by the? Or, well, I guess what that's Neil it. Kramer, but you've taken on his work yeah. and expanded yeah, on it a little it. bit. But the, the matrix, what I call is what the things we're being lied to, right? The setup of the matrix right. controls we all know about. The control structure is the matrix, but then there's a exactly. second matrix that a lot of truthers and, and freedom people fall into. Exactly. They get caught into the second matrix, get caught into the labyrinth of their own mind, right? In the mental apparatus of just like information overload and like um, not being able to just have no discernment anymore at all. 
and trying to figure it out intellectually because you never understand the matrix intellectually and your mind can fool you. You know, there's so much, as you know, we need to question the mainstream media, absolutely, right? But there's a lot of nonsense in the quote unquote conspiracy and truth movement out there as well. Extreme French stuff, right? right. Uh, which is like absurd, even like the, uh, you know, I've written an article about this recently, um, you know, that the reincarnation is a soul trap and you know, if there's a prison, I don't, we don't, shouldn't come back here. It's extremely dark and, and victimizing, right? That's the last thought I want to have on my, in my mind, believing that reincarnation is a trap and don't go to the light. And this is, this is a prison plan. What I, what I really hate about that narrative, and I, and I, <laughs> what I hate about that, if I may comment on that real quick, and I have yeah. a, one of my close family members um, went down the Howdy Mikowski rabbit hole. And I will say like, I, I plan on interviewing Howdy at some point. So I want, I want to give, give him a platform to share. And I, I want to push back a little bit, but just the general concept that this reality that we're experiencing is controlled by archons who are so powerful and so malevolent that they were able to structure this reality and trick us into coming back into this reality to harvest and, and siphon energy from us just yeah. sounds absurd, especially because, I mean, I look at this life and reincarnation itself and I'm like, man, even with all of the traumatic things that I've experienced, and I had quite a traumatic childhood, like very traumatic childhood. I look at it and I'm grateful for all of it. And I, I would love to come back to this place. Yeah. Despite no, how crazy it is, or maybe yeah, because yeah. of how crazy it is, I would love exactly. to come back here. No, I can tell you right away. I mean, I also, I don't know disrespect to anybody who, <laughs> who talks about this uh, soul reincarnation trap and has done their research, but I don't, I take more the words of somebody like Sri Aurobindo, a true light master. There was a whole book on karma and reincarnation of somebody who has really knows based on gnosis and not some, fringe researcher, I'm sorry, you know, uh, and the ancient teachings who show the whole idea of, and karma is extremely, and reincarnation, extremely, extremely complex topic. People have oversimplified it. Yes, it has been used for social control and, 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 and victim blaming and all of that, but it's a highly complex topic that the mind cannot comprehend, mm. right? And I've seen people who think, you know, I've seen this in myself, I've, I've said the same thing back you know, when I was down and about, I will never come back here. I don't know why I decided to come back here. I, I'm not going to reincarnate back into this earth. This is a shit place, prison planet. I literally had the same thoughts. And now looking back, doing my work, it was a trauma response. Mm -hmm. Because who's the I saying, I don't want to be here. I don't want to come back here. Well, so well, it's think a about the underlying response. disempowerment. It's not the true self. Yeah, well, yeah, th yeah. think about the underlying disempowerment behind that too, because that that sets up a scenario subconsciously or maybe even consciously where you think you are so powerless to change the circumstances yes. of your own reality yeah. that you're just like, fuck it. I don't want to come back here. This place is hell. And it's like, that is a psyop in and of itself because that then gives more power to the parasitic class that exists or the yeah. the mind virus that is Watiko that feeds off of us because yeah. we think then we are not able to change the circumstances here and now at a subconscious level, whether that's how the likes of Howdy Mikowski or David Icke communicate it. That's, that's not the case necessarily, but that is yeah. what is subconsciously communicated by that. It's like, fuck, this is a prison planet that I have no power to change. Yeah. I have no way okay. to orient my life in a, in a way that is beautiful for me. And I just don't believe that. That's, that's just not my no. experience. No, I know this, uh, in that sense, it's very, dis like you said, it's disempowering is actually a victim blame trap. Right? right. That's what I call it. And going back to, you know, because even these people, and that's why one of the things with David Icke, I had to kind of like, I, unfortunately for me, as I said, he kind of watched his VHS tape in the nineties kind of initiated. But even back then I, I kind of stopped listening to him because for me back then, he never really talks about any necess necessary inner psycho spiritual work. He's for me a good example is respect him, what he has been through, but it's so clear that he has not really done any inner work. The way he projects the shadows, the triggers, it's so obvious. And he's become so hardened and cynical and dark and black-pilled. And he promotes this whole simulation recycling trap. And, you know, here's the thing, talking about the true self, but I know in my mind body, true self, 
have all these parts beyond my ego structure, my true self, my true essence wants to be here, loves to be here, doesn't want to be anywhere else, embraces this moment and wants to engage. Yes, let's do this. Right. Absolutely. I don't want to be anywhere else. I chose to be here. Yes. When there's somebody else, a thought injection comes here right away, that's trying to, uh, you know, that gets me into some sort of complaint, blame, victim. I know I'm not in my true self. And that's the true essence of inner work. You really know when you really more embody this work, then you can sense within yourself when you're truly in essence, your true self, or a wounded part is coming up, which you mistake for your true self, right? And that's a key point. And there are all kinds of metaphysical or cult issues having this deep belief system that this is a trap and reincarnation is a trap. And by the way, people who know my work, I've talked about this hyperdimensional matrix, arconic forces or cult hostile forces, draconian forces, you know, Ariman, Luciferian forces from the rule of Steiner perspective or whatever angle you mean. See, for many years, there's definitely other forces manipulating totally. humanity, totally. but they want us to believe that they're more powerful than we actually right. are. Number one. That's the key. Number, the key point, number two, they also serve a teaching function. That's what people yes. understand. They have a teaching. Evil has a teaching function. They're ev That's a paradox. They're part of the divine too. Right. And evil cannot exist as an absolute. It's not actually a true duality, evil and good. There's only the divine, but there's also the inconscient, the, the, you know, the divine experiencing himself subjectively in everything, and all forces have free will in their own evolutionary process. These archonic forces are also in their evolutionary process, and they will evolve to some angelic beings at some point as well. You right? know, you, so you, you bring up such an important <laughs> point. For those that are listening or watching this that take issue with him saying that the, quote, darker... Uh, elements or, or or actors that are at play are an aspect of the divine, I want you to at least consider the possibility, just like you referred back to earlier, that they are playing an important role in our awakening in that they are acting as the antagonist for us to come and be the protagonist to help us evolve and, and deepen ourselves and deepen our path auth authenticity. Like, just like you said, yeah. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now had yes. the whole COVID trade not occurred. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So many others, I see this as well. And sometimes it leads to disillusionment, right? And it, but it, it also leads to, you need to take self-responsibility because nobody's going to save you and there will be support. I've seen the divine support me in many other ways, but most often it's not as you think it is or as you like it to be, like the ego, right? I've had many uh, hardships in my life too, or, you know, when you look back, um, you know, all kinds of uh, even horrible breaks up with relationships where I almost, I, I was very suicidal taking myself out, but these experiences looking back were initiations. They were important lessons, similar, I'm sure, in your life as well, that put me in the next next level, so to speak. The issue or problem have people have nowadays, I think, especially with this religious revival, over the years, they project human qualities into the divine with human morality, right? But God, the divine, exists beyond human morality, even beyond human logic. It doesn't act in the way we think it acts. It doesn't punish us or rewards, right? Even the Christian oversimplified idea that, you know, there's Satan and there's God as if they are separate from each other and all of that. It's a very oversimplified idea. And because why could would, would do God something horrible like this and all these things? You don't know the trajectory, right? I'm, I'm sure you've heard maybe of this parable of uh, this Chinese parable of the farmer, um, and he's attending to his field, and 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 he has his horse, and this horse, uh, you know, runs away. All of a sudden, fuck, he cannot, you know, attend to his field anymore. And this oh, it's a bad thing, you know, and the neighbors come, is it good or bad? Like, oh my, sorry, this is, this is horrible. And he says, good or bad, we will see, I don't know. And all of a sudden the horse comes back with a whole herd and then it's a good thing, right? Yeah. The story evolves, I'm sure you've heard about that yeah. story. So you never know, we have this very limited view of it. This is good, this is bad, right? Do you good, this is bad. And I see this in the truth of movement as well. Everybody have like, oh, you know, people have TDS, Trump, bad orange man, or Trump, the savior, right? Or Elon right. Musk, bad, 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 bad robot man, or the savior. And like, it's extremely oversimplified without really understanding what their roles are, you know? Right. Um, and again, I've seen it in black and white many times, but even evil, that's the essence of shadow work. I talked about this in a recent little video about Wetiko. And I had Paul Levy on several times, and his his work has been very distorted as well. That people see Vertigo evil always out there in others, 
but not within themselves. And that's a key point. We need to face the potential for evil within ourselves. Not, not that we actually are, but there's a potential within all of that. As I like to say, we need to get in touch with our own inner Klaus Schwab and <laughs> Bill Gates and all of that. You know, not that we're acting out of that, but as long as we externalize all evil and see it out there and we think we are just the good guys in this virtual signaling way, the matrix has us. So, yeah, it's, 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 long... it's, it's really hard for people to reconcile with the reality that within them, there is some capacity for some level of evil too. Yeah. Like that, that, that is a tough one for people to reconcile, but that is one of the key points of doing the shadow work is recognizing like, what is it within me that I, you know, am, am, am so triggered by this experience outside of me. And it's like, I have the capacity for this as well. And that's hard yeah. to reconcile with. It's very hard, you know, and the ego will deny it. They will rationalize it away. And it doesn't have, evil doesn't have to be on this high level, but even every little things, the way we get triggered, the way we lie to ourselves, the way we lie to others, you know, or maybe greed comes in or it's even social media, all kinds of people plagiarize and steal and all these, you know, as if whatever. And uh, so in every single day, we are faced with, you know, acting in integrity or acting based on our false self and lying to others and ourselves. So... It is not easy work. I, it, there's resistance. It's much easier to project externally. I always say that it's it's way harder. I like to say it's way harder to face the truth within yourselves. Or let's put it me this way: it's way easier to see the lies in the world in the matrix as opposed to the lies you tell yourself. Right? right. That's what you know. I remember Gurdjieff saying that you know, in order to understand the interrelationship between truth and lies in the world, you need to have to know the interrelationship between truth and lies within yourself, and nobody wants to know that. So right. and that's yeah. been, that's, that's for me, like, it requires a certain level of humility, right? Even throughout my journey, I've written about many things. And sometimes, okay, looking back, well, I kind of, I guess I was off about this, but may, you know, not having these, again, the ego can easily think that it has figured it out already, you know, and, and life has taught me enough to know that who knows what the future will bring, right? I don't know, you know? Right. So, <laughs> I, wa I want to ask you your like, like, I guess a deeper question on the, the processes or the things you do to engage in shadow work. I know we've touched briefly on it, but yeah. um, a lot of people talk about the need to do the work and yeah. what, what does that entail for, for you? So that's a great question. Um, first of all, we really enjoy, because it has become very popular nowadays. So it's really, first of all, understanding what is shadow work and how to do shadow work, right? And that's based on obviously Carl Jung's work. And there are many, you know, even Jung's work, reading his original work is not easy. That, you know, I recommend maybe reading books from a young psychologist. But in a sense, understanding really the concept of trigger and projection. So when I, you know, have the self-awareness, when Somebody says something, they see something, I get triggered, it gets me upset, emotionally riled up, right? You know, having the awareness to, instead of like blaming the other person, right, right away for whatever they said, or he or she said and whatnot, to look within, what does it remind me of? Why Why is this, why uh, am I getting so upset at this, this, this person's words and whatnot? There must be something within me because right. you can only get triggered the shadow by somebody else that has a tag within you, mm. right? So that there has to be some sort of, and what it, so the, the main question is, what does it remind me of? And if you're sincere in the inquiry within yourself, you can actually just most often trace it back to something and to childhood, to your parents, your upbringing, whatever it may be, right? Sometimes you cannot, but then you need to um, process the emotion. And that's mm -hmm. a key point. The aspect of shadow work is also the emotional process, not intellectualizing and dealing with the emotion that comes up. Yeah. And the key point with the emotional process, and that's easier said than done, is to allow yourself to feel it in order to transmute it without projecting it onto others and not without identifying it either. So and for that, example, that, is the, that is the balancing point. That that's is a, that's so... the toughest part because I, right. I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm, we identify with the emotion, which is, this is not who you are, but in this moment, I'm experiencing anger flowing through me. I'm experiencing sadness, so I need to sit with this and process it. 
Right. Anger is a more trickier emotion to process. It sometimes requires a physical release, right? That's right. why I like dancing, whatever it may be, fighting. I box. Sport. This, is, box. And this exactly. is the one that I've, I've, I've gone on the pendulum of in the, in the <laughs> past. I used to project it onto people and get in a lot of fist fights. And yeah. then I started suppressing it. And then it manifested as physical pain in my body. Yes. And yeah, then yeah. now Perfect. I release it on my punk, uh, punching bag in my garage. I, I box there the go. punching bag. Exactly. So there are many other ways. Yeah but it needs to be released. You cannot suppressing it is no good. People dissociate over time. It can literally manifest in not only tension, but disease, cancer, right? These right. most, for the most part are suppressed emotions. Um, but really having the awareness uh, and also with projections, you know, becoming aware. I mean, actually if, if Twitter or any social media is a perfect place to apply shadow work, you just need to observe yourself. I'm not free from it. I go to timeline and right away I see other people's posts and I judge. I project. What an idiot. This is you're stupid. Speaking, I'm Look laughing you. because you're speaking exactly like me. I, that's, so that's I can I, I can totally own that. There's yeah. this voice coming up, the you know, uh, part of myself, arrogant Bernhard and the know it all. Like this is ridiculous. I could I'm, you know, this is stupid. Who are you? Who do you think you are? So these are all these projections, right? Yeah. But then remembering. You know, that's what, hold on, I don't know this person at all. Why am, and then you use again, the self-inquiry, why am I so, why do I get so upset about this person? Why? And then you will, the voice here to rationalize, well, because of this and this and that, but no, but why can't I just approach it more calmly and rational and like grounded? There's an emotional response. So there means, must be something within me that's tagging into that again, right? Mm -hmm. Some sort of issue. So maybe this person reminds me of my mom or my dad or some other person. You know, that's that's most often the case. And we project that. I mean, literally, like Carl Jung said, when we meet another person, and that was back in this in person, who knows it, on social media is even worse. When we meet another person, when we first meet them, it's literally 80% of our projections of who we think the person is mm. and hardly who the person really is. Now, ex you know, on social media is even more severe. We have no in-person interaction not even, you know, we just see words on the screen and then we judge the other person. And I would also argue as I get attacked by a lot of trolls, you know, and all these tough guys, anonymous behind the keyboard would have never the balls to tell me certain things in my face in person, totally. you know, similar, maybe to, I can hold this myself, certain comments I made in the past to some people. I'm not sure if I would tell this person these words in person, not because I'm, I'm, I'm a coward or anything, but maybe when, when I look into this person's eyes and feel the energy, I would have a different approach <laughs> than just blaring my opinion. You'd on recognize them as human. You'd recognize exactly. them as another exactly. human being. And you and it, and it immediately, I think, for most people would trigger some sort of empathetic response where it's like, ah, you know yeah. what? Maybe I don't have the full story on this person or ah, maybe yeah. I see something or I feel something energetically by being in their field that indicates to me that there's maybe a little bit some there's more there than I realized. Yeah, exactly. And 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 I'm not pulling falling into blind compassion. It's another issue, no. right? Like this over like, oh, just be all nice for everyone. No, sometimes we need boundaries. Sometimes we need to call a spade a spade. I can be very direct, absolutely. Right. But most often I know that people were uh, act out of their own wounding and trauma. That's why even I don't find it helpful in the truth of movement to call people COVID idiots, sheeple, normies all of that as if they're below, right? I mean, right. understand sometimes you use these words in order to kind of like describe certain groups of people. But if one of the biggest traps I've talked about this as well, and it's almost an involuntary byproduct of the awakening pro uh, process is the trap of superiority, right? <laughs> Which we all can easily fall into. Uh, but I've worked with so many people as well. I know people who go along with the jab or go along with COVID. They're, you know, they're just deeply programmed, conditioned, wounded people. Right, they're not. They participate in evil and become, um, you know, agents of "quote unquote" evil. But projecting on them, putting them down on that, and now being angry at them, is not going to help it. It's going to just make it worse. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's the issue. And I'm not saying I don't have the ultimate solution here, but with social media, that's even more, um, more has become more extreme. I think bringing awareness to it, though, is the precursor to developing the solution. And the solution is on the individual level anyway. I mean, even yeah. you just saying that right now, I acknowledge, like I recognize in myself when it comes to voluntarism slash anarchism, and I see people who are indoctrinated in the left versus yeah. right statist 
uh, illusion, as I call it, the illusion of authority, I see some sus- superiority coming in me because I get so frustrated that other, quote, awake people yeah. or people who can see what's going on in the world fall right back into what I perceive to be the psyop of politics. But then that leads me to engage sometimes in a way where I feel that I have the superior position. And I'm like, when I reflect on the times where I have engaged in that way without catching myself in that triggered state, did I communicate in a way that was helpful to get people to see my position? Absolutely yeah. not. No yeah. way. Yeah. No way. I did a disservice to this position. Yeah. It made made you maybe feel better in the moment, like I assured him <laughs> kind of thing. Right. Like but then I felt worse like, afterwards. Yeah, the same, felt- yeah, same. But yeah. I can relate to that. But even that, I mean, on that note, I used to be an anarchist. I'm not identifying with because for me it's like anarchist and statism, same label, right? right? I was always right. I never voted. It was I wrote an article about the stupidity of voting for eons, you know. Yeah. But I remember um I was invited to speak at Anarchapulco. Yeah, like, I just spoke at Anarchapulco this year. Oh, you year. did? That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I was, I think, uh, 2017 or 18, like, you know, a lot of volunteerist anarchists there. And Jeff Bervik, he organized it. And remember, he had me on his podcast in 2017. And one of his opening questions was, so when did you become an anarchist? And then I told him, well, I don't identify as an anarchist. Mm-hmm. And the main reason when I also saw that and I appreciate the ideology from an intellectual level. Yes, it makes sense, but we are not there on a collective body level. No chance. I've seen, I've seen too many people getting hooked on the intellectualizing the process, you know, and really talking down on status and all of that, right? I've right. done the same. It's not helpful. I just recorded an episode on this with Carrie Wedler, who's another voluntarist as am I, who we have yeah. come to the same conclusion that, that you are sharing. Oh, I, know, right I, know, I, know, I know, Carrie. I've, yeah. We have, we have uh, been just Spoken at similar events. I've I've met Larkin Rose. Uh, I've yeah. read his books. Super, um, uh, the most big, dangerous superstition. superstition. Exactly, and all of yeah. that. I think it's great. But what I've also seen within not everyone this anarchist movement, their own blind spots. A lot of them are actually very hardcore materialists, atheists, like all yes. oh, the ego yeah. individual, just me in sovereign. Uh, you know. Well, also a subtle Which, like pointing can perpetually at the government. Look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. But like, what about what we are even as self-professed voluntarists consenting to? Yeah. What about exactly. us and our decisions on a daily basis? Exactly. And then I like to take a step further. Like anarchists, we don't, anarchism, no rulers, like no government, we are our own, right? Yeah. We're soft, right? But I say, you cannot even govern yourself. <laughs> I I cannot govern myself. I have the, you know, the CEO, the president, the, the overriding tyrant in my own head that right. judges me, that my own manager, inner critic, and all of that subconscious drives I have no control over. Right. I cannot govern con- myself, literally, you know, because I'm not fully embodied. I'm not enlightened. Right. So right. the way I see it collectively, what we experience, because as within, so without, of course, we have to have government because that's where we are at collectively. And we right. cannot intellectualize ourselves through it. Like Sri Obinda talked about this beautifully. He talked about, he wrote about 100 years ago that the rise of this uh, socialist world new order, actually, warning about it. That's, will become because of the evolution of consciousness and there will be an anarchistic impulse. You call about anarchism, but he said it will be mostly an intellectual anarchism, right? Based on the mental idea, which is fine, but it's not enough. It's just mentalized. What we need to have is to spiritualize quote unquote anarchism, but that happens not by externalizing it, imposing, right? But to our inner process. So before we become true embodied anarchists, and fight the systems, we need to learn how to govern ourselves because I see a lot of anarchists not being questioning where the desires come from, being very reactive. That's another thing. Where do my desires come from? People just have want what they want, right? Not wondering maybe that desire comes from a because they've been told or taught parental programming or a trauma response right. to fill a hole within. So that it goes very deep when you see it more from a spiritual, metaphysical perspective, right? So I'm I'm, I'm all for voluntarism, uh, anarchism, but I've seen a lot of the commun- communities come and go because none of them really engage in the inner work. And they're just trying to impose something externally based on some sort of intellectual ideal. You know, it, it's so crazy how much you're speaking to common threads that have been occurring in my mind, which is why I was so looking forward to this interview so Mm -hmm. much, man. Um, But another thing that I said the other day along the same thread, 
and I've been a outspoken voluntarist over the last two and a half years. I said, if I'm being honest, I think the government is great for people who still want to behave like children, want someone else to govern their affairs, won't take ownership of their own thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and actions, won't stop projecting their own shit onto others, and want someone to blame for everything, need a mommy to give them things, need a daddy to protect them, and need both of them to tell them what to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's that's part of it. And also, like, um, I mean, it's, again, we never, when you bring the spiritual perspective and how the divine works, you never know, you know, even with, you can see about government, like even Trump, you know, there are extreme polarizing ideas about Trump, even within the truth movement and all of that. But from my outside perspective, he plays an important role, an evolutionary role that is important, right? I don't buy into the idea that he's the savior, but I also don't buy into the idea that he's a psyop, you know, controlled up, just trying to, you know, it's too black and white. You know, it's really fascinating what's going on, you know, in, in that regard, because it helps this, in his own distortion, you know, helps an evolutionary process, so to speak, as, as does anybody else. I based it on, I read something very profound again from Shia Binder that the divine uses any instrument to its best ability, no matter how distorted, right? And I'm not implying that Trump is now an instrument of the divine, but we all, everybody is in their own way. Right. Distortions, right. right? We all already align with divine will. We do good, but then it gets distorted with our own crap, right? Our own projections. Obviously, you know, his. The, the the vax issue on him, like his own ego is in the way. It's it's glaringly obviously in so many ways, his own narcissism, which in the Q people say it's just, oh, it's 5D and he can never <laughs> do wrong. And it's all, you know, he can literally never do wrong. There's a, they're suffering from positive projections, right? Right. Golden uh, golden shadow. And the the left or others project a negative shadow onto him, right? He, right. he deals, he has to deal with a lot of projections, actually. So he has to carry a lot. You know, that's why you have to have almost that kind of persona. But regardless, anyone in their own distortions, even Biden, you know, right? you know, he also helps to kind of see how ridiculous the system is. <laughs> right. Supposing, you know what I mean? In a way, like even that some quote normies and lefties wake up that this is insane. What are we actually doing? Right. So, you know, to see it that way, um, again, that everything has its role in the evolutionary trajectory, you know, in the positive sense. And then using this opportunity to come to a deep alignment within ourselves, mm -hmm. but it requires a spiritual revolution. That's the key point, a spiritual um, approach, an aspiration to something higher, to something bigger, beyond religions, beyond an external God and all of that, and beyond a new age approach, because it implies the psychological work, because the way I see it, the psychological work is necessary to remove all that that's in the way of true self essence coming through. And mm -hmm. the more I'm coming from that place, the more I have creativity, the more I'm doing my work. Um, and the less I uh, feel actually any fear for the future, the more I'm actually having faith, not hope, but I'm like, this is going as it's supposed to go. And I understand looking back in my life, one lesson I've learned that all this are lessons. That's how it's, that's my philosophy. All there is are lessons, no matter how tough. And we sometimes don't know what, that's another thing. Sorry, I'm, I'm going on the rant here. No, I love, I love this. This is great. This has been great. <laughs> you know, that's that's another thing, even when I with the Palestine thing about, oh, standing up for Palestine, the poor Palestinian people and the pictures. I remember they're posting all the same stuff what people post nowadays 10 years ago. But now with my awareness, understanding, deeper insight on a spiritual perspective, even over a lifetime's comic, what do I know about the soul lesson about this person over there when I'm hardly still figuring out my own shit, right? That's, you know, and I'm really, and I'm the, I don't want to use karma as a cop out. Well, this is just their karma, right? No. But there are bigger cycles, bigger lessons over life. There are things that started eons, lifetimes, ages ago that need to play themselves out collectively, which we have no control over, by the way. The ego things like, hold on, this is, we should, you know, get rid of those and, you know, all of this trying to like copy paste the edit reality, right? But, you know, no, there's, again, and having worked with so many people, that's helped me a lot as well, especially with Laura to do this deep work with one-on-one -on -one. When people are dealing with, struggling with their despair, hardship, you know, deaths in family and, 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 and struggle and suffering. Um, there's, we need a whole different approach to really what's going on in the world. And that, yeah. 
requires a holistic integral approach on all levels, the physical health, the psychological health, the emotional health, the spiritual health, what I call the fourfold approach. And then the intellectual too, as part of the information process. Um, but again, there's something bigger going on and mm. we're being fooled by watching clips on Twitter about then we think what's going on in the world, like these edited clips, right? And there's a lot of madness going on, especially the open border stuff, right? I know you're in Texas, I'm here in Arizona, affected by that. And then we need to be practical guide um, action as well. I'm all for it. Maybe we may actually need government for this because the whole anarchist idea of like, oh, there's open borders and like, fuck government. This is also not practical especially right within now. this context. Yeah, and I've exactly. talked about that. <laughs> no. it, but, the, but the ironic thing is you could argue that at some level, largely this issue was was orchestrated initially by government, but <laughs> where we're at right now, it's like shit. Yeah. Is this yeah, exactly. is the most optimal solution at this point in time? A little bit of government. And it's like fuck. I go back and forth on that yeah. quite a bit. Yeah, but and it's there's some there's some bigger cycles than that. On my wife Laura, she's she's also a professional astrologer. Specific, she goes deep into evolutionary astrology, which is very profound type of esoteric astrology. It's not your typical New Age mainstream. Mm -hmm. And it looks about cycles over lifetimes. And even like certain nations and countries have their own chart and transits and, and experiences and lessons to go through. And right now we're going through a Pluto return of the US, which is a huge transit. It's like a rebirth, death rebirth. First process, time since 1775 or 1776. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I don't know. I, have to I think so. I think, I think that like, this is, this is the first time that it's, that the planets have been aligned this way since 1775, 1776, which is and, a huge deal. And a lot of people have a lot of opinions about astrology, but people who denounce it really don't understand it or have not really right. studied it. So just on the side note, right. And they think astrology is part of the matrix. So I see other people, karma is not real. Karma is a trap, you know, and, and, and again, so it's fascinating, by the way. I see this a lot in the truth of movement. Going back real quick on this whole idea that karma is not real; it's it's a program or reincarnation trap, and and all of that. That we're almost being lured to denounce and throw away deep spiritual truths mm -hmm. and part of our collective evolution and evolutionary processes, right? Literally throwing out the baby with the bathwater, you know, in, in our paranoid mindset. But what I'm saying is there are these bigger cycles happening. Right, which the signs of us psycho spiritual signs of astrology control us as well, which we need to align ourselves with. I think that's the key point. Rather than trying to fix out that, we want need to align with what needs to happen, and that alignment ha needs to happen within ourselves. And I feel the more we align with our true selves and come from that place, the more we do God's work. What we're here to do, because my mm -hmm. attitude is everybody is here to do something only he or she can do and provide. Absolutely, mm -hmm. that cancel out any competition and whatnot, you know, like what you're doing, nobody else could do what I'm doing. I don't know, you know, in my own way. And too many people nowadays, they're disconnected from their creative spirit where we talked at the beginning, right? Because that's how the matrix works. They want us to become mindless consumers, just scrolling down, right? Just, you know, and get addicted to drugs, social media, games, whatever it may be. Don't hold concentration, focus, cannot read anything anymore. Um, but that's how we give away the key to the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. In order to step up. And I see so many people fall into also nowadays, especially in the truth of movement. This is a whole topic in itself, the, what I call the poverty matrix program, right? I'm sure you have been, I think you posted about something, people getting upset because you charge. Oh my God, you charge yeah. money for your work. <laughs> I charge as well. But at the same time, we put a lot of effort and a lot of free information, right. which also talks money, energies, blood and sweat and tears, focus, concentration and work to produce. Right. Right. And uh, and it also goes against natural law in so many ways, not to get be an energy exchange. It also goes the against like voluntarious change. principles. And a lot of the people who get upset are ironically voluntarist, but they're they've subscribed right. to a communist ideology where they think they should be given everything for free. Exactly. So and that's got you know, and then but open the flow and like then you, then but that's how and then they blame the banksters and the, the Rothschilds and taxes and I agree taxation is theft and all of that, right? But then you get the opposite end and think money is evil and these are evil. And I had the same program too, right? right? Uh, I always thought everybody who's rich is an evil psychopath and all of that. 
but it was coming from my poverty consciousness. And I'm not until I worked through that was I able to create abundance and prosperity within myself. <laughs> same with me. Same, <laughs> same. same thing. Same been, thing. You know, I was jealous. I can, could own my own unconscious jealousy and envy, you know, mm -hmm. why I'm talking shit about others, like somebody I don't know at all, like judging him because he charges this amount for something. I don't know why, what he's doing, but he's an asshole for charging. <laughs> so, like, right, right. <laughs> Right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's awesome talking with you, like I said, because so many of the things that are, you know, rummaging around in your mind, as I've been able to pick your brain here, like it's, it's reflecting so much of my own and in, internal process and experience and being able to hold uh, almost seemingly paradoxically two different perspectives at the same time and being able to not get pulled into one end of the polarization and not stay balanced for the sake of staying balanced because that's the only approach, but it's, it's not getting pulled into these identity groups that, that latch onto you. And then you take on an identity that is not you because you become the group that you're yeah, a part of. And that's it, a key it, point. That's, yeah. that's we have to be careful of group hive mind. And especially yeah. nowadays, I see, you know, especially people who join our programs, they want to be around like-minded people, which is important. I agree. It's great to be around like-minded people. But that can in itself become also shadow dance and you support each other's projections and neuroses. Right. I want to be around like-minded people who are also engaged in the same work, right? right? Engaged in the, at, at this, and then it's very powerful, right? Yeah. So you, you incorporate that as well with the same aim, really acknowledging you know, we have the same intention, same aim, but we have a different process within all of that, right. right? We're looking into the same direction, but, you know, we see this when we work in our group coaching program, we're together in this, in this, in this container, but we see that everybody's it's different stuff comes up. Everybody mm -hmm. has their own process, but at the same time, we inspire each other. And also I have to say, there's only so much you can, we need each other. We cannot do this work alone, mm -hmm. right? It's easy to isolate yourself. That's another big issue. People isolate themselves, you know, they're, armchair conspiracy theorists just online all day long. That's not healthy, right? Relationships are breaking down. We don't even know how to relate anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we need the mirror. The relational aspect is key nowadays, right? This is this, this to counteract uh, also this whole age of AI and transhumanism. Mm -hmm. I have one last question for you, Bernard. It's, yeah. it's pronounced Bernard, right? I, I yeah, pronounce correct. it in a very Bernhard. American American way. <laughs> yeah, you, you got it right. The, the, usually they swallow the H, but you got it. <laughs> Bernhard, okay. Um, you, you talked about how what's going on out there in, in, in a meta perspective is not in our control, not in our direct control. And then I look at like the way this reality works is that we are each within a within a certain spectrum of ability, because I think that there is a supreme being that is in charge of all of this, that we are inherently inextricably linked to in almost different modulations of, but in a, in a yeah. sort of veiled limited capacity, so to speak, but yeah. that we are, that objective reality is dancing with that balanced out with our, each of our co-creative capacities overlapping on top of each other. So I guess my question is, how much of an impact do we truly have on our own reality? Well, that's a question when I always like to, not to go too metaphysical, but, you know, this ties into we create our own reality, you create your own reality. We, are, we know the New Age has distorted it with this idea of totally. solips, lie of solipsism and all of that, right? And just like bubble. But the question always, and I asked it in some one of my workshops too, when we talk about we are co-creators, we create, I create. Again, who's the I? That's in the question. Who's the I creating? Know thyself. And I know for myself, when I go deeper, the I who I think I am is all kinds of mishmash of different thoughts, emotions, desires, memories, conditioning, programming from past lives, right? Where's, again, the stable I? Who's the I creating? Who's the deeper I? Who's the true yeah, like, I? Like, who's like the ego? Is the ego you know, that's what I'm saying. But when you go really deeper, and I had uh, moments like that, is that I am not creating reality, the I, but what I am doing is open my, can open up the vessel for spirit, for the divine creating through me, right? This is the divine will. And that we are all constantly influenced by forces. And this is the ultimate illusion that the ego thinks it's control. 
And Sartre wrote this beautifully, he was a student of Sri Aurobindo, that um, none of us, our actions are our own. We're constantly influenced by other forces mm -hmm. from the whole spectrum, from the anti-divine, hostile, demonic, you know, up to the divine. And depending on our level being and where we tune into, our actions are guided by this. There are people who are literally vessels for demonic, archonic, armonic forces, right? We see this in, in the global politics or based on the law of nature, right? Based just sex, greed, and, and all of that, just uh, in, um, the, the, the gross form of, of these energies. There are also other forces manipulating this and influencing this and creating this through us. But the more we come to, again, to the inner work, to an inner, to a true self by removing all that's in the way, the psycho-spiritual work, we become a channel, we create reality of the thoughts of the divine through us. Hmm. So that's like the I is just a vessel for the higher force to create reality through us. That's the way I see it. It's very, and it's, <laughs> I think it's, it's hard for the mind to grasp because for me, it's also such an inner experience um, because for me, when I do my meditation, uh, my daily meditation, my prayers, I don't ask for things anymore. I ask for, I want to be the clearest vessel possible to manifest your will through me. I am giving my will to you, whatever you think is necessary. Use me as your vessel. And I can see in the back of my mind, the ego, like, hold on, but you want what you want, not trusting it, right? There's this part of me, absolutely, that doesn't want to give himself completely because like, oh, this is scary because the ego doesn't want to let go of control. But what I've learned when I let go of that and open myself up, all of a sudden I get infused with ideas, creative ideas that result in action and even, but I cannot claim it that I did it. Does it make sense? Totally. It's the best I can yes. try to explain it. Yes. Right? I think once we have become more understand that we are transducers, as I like to call it, of the higher will, of other forces, the game changes. But depending on our level of soul embodiment and how much we have done the inner work or soul trajectory, we can be vessels for uh, anti-divine forces or for divine forces. Most often it's a mix of two on a daily basis, mm -hmm. right? Anytime when I get triggered, projected, you know, you know, and like, and then this, I want to just project on this person. There's always another force that kind of like talks me yeah. into it. It's like the, you know, the, the Native American of the white wolf and the, the, the black wolf or the, the angel. one you feed. Yeah. The feed, that kind of thing, right? right? That's really about, you don't know this if you not have not developed a certain level of self-awareness. And yeah. that's a key point. And if I would say anything to the truth movement, you know, you, we need to become, you need to establish the first, most important part of self-work is establishing the observer to really become more self-aware. Because mm -hmm. most often we just identify right away with our thoughts, emotions, actions. We don't question where they come from because our mind is porous. It's not isolated, right? Mm -hmm. We also are subjected to taking the thoughts and feelings and thoughts of the collective, of groups. There's group psychosis and all of that happens a lot, right? On the, on the side note, really quick, uh, one student of our group program had a profound experience. He lives in New York. And he was working on meditations and he was in a more sensitive, alerted state. So I was in New York City and all of a sudden he came by this protest, like hundreds or thousands of people protested pro-Palestine. And he literally saw like this, these thought forms, energy coming from the outside in his own mind and having the same thoughts and got excited. Yes, pro-Palestine, fuck Israel. He, he felt himself getting injected by the group hive, hive mind thought entity. The the egregore. The so there's like a literal egregore. Exactly, that egregore, exactly like that, you know? Yeah. So that we are also influenced by that. So we need to be very aware. Where do your thoughts, this is your thought to begin with, right? Mm. But we need to, most important is developing self-awareness. And it's not an easy way. You know, you know that I know that I'm not claiming to be fully awake. I sometimes have shitty days. I complain, I, uh, whatever, Right. Uh, but then uh, more days I'm enlightened. I mean, that ties into another law, just on a side, uh, real quick, universal law, really important to understand the law of ascent and dis descent, mm -hmm. um, which means you can only rise as high up, as low and deep you're willing to go within your own shadow and, yeah. and, and reintegrate it, right? That The famous quote by Carl Jung, a tree that re reaches to heaven needs to have its roots in hell. Or Sri Aurobindo even said, no one can reach heaven who has not walked through hell metaphorically speaking, because the, 
the awakening process, not this new age, like love and light and 5D and everything. Yada, you know, that's recipe for shadow suppression and, and a lot of yeah. issues on. Uh, no, sometimes I know also I go up and then drags me down. So when you're down and about, it doesn't mean that you attracted it because of your bad thoughts. It's just a necessary pull down in order to clear up, you know, and integrate more in order to rise higher. And, and that keeps... takes the weight off of those those down moments too, when you exactly. recognize that, oh, yeah. this is just a part of it. Just a part, it's a phase and be with it, allow yourself to feel. But most, what do most people do? They avoid it. You know, we give people and um, pharmaceuticals for that, just a pill or they smoke pot or they watch, uh, I don't know, um, Netflix or social media just to avoid feeling feeling. But the way out is in and through. So again, it's, like, it's either that or they become so distraught that they are having another down experience that they just cave to it and then they self-sabotage yeah. and become yeah. worse. Exactly. And I, I have experienced yeah. the cell. I had moments, you know, sometimes even for years ago, I can go into depths into despair and I can sense other forces like suicidal thought injections coming in. This is like, fuck this, you know, like, because I mean, we could go on and on, but once you're in this process, you will attract a certain attention and there are other forces that do not want you to awaken. Yeah. Right. So you have to have the um, the spirit of a warrior. And these are tests and lessons, right? There's they work through temptations too, right? It's like the film The Matrix. You don't want to become like Cypher, and he goes out to dinner with Agent Smith to take the blue pill again because he gets all the riches and all of that, right? right. There's all these kind of tests, temptations, and lessons on the path. I've seen this myself. Mm. But when you're down and about, know that the divine for me. That's when I go into prayer, right? I know I need to go through this. And God will be with me in whatever shape and form. Uh, and I have the assistance, but I also need to learn the lesson. I need to pull myself out of this, right? Mm -hmm. In order to come to better alignment. So <laughs> good medicine, good medicine for the for the truther and freedom community. Good medicine <laughs> for me too. Yeah. This is this has been great. Where can I'll, I'll throw it in the show notes, but where can people find more on your work and your partner's work? Uh, so my main website is veilofreality.com. So all my writings are there, videos, interviews. Uh, I've, I've produced a couple of films too. Um, and also well, the, our podcast is on there. We have a, my wife and I we have a podcast, the Cosmic Matrix podcast. You can also find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, we talk about various topics. And we also have an ongoing program called Time of Transition Embodied Soul Awakening, which I mentioned mm -hmm. where we go deep 14 week program, just limited people by application only 14 weeks doing deep psycho spiritual work based on this in and outer work we just talked about. And people can find out more about this at the website that time of transition.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, we start, you know, just we're starting a new cycle soon in May again. So there's still some spots left. Yeah, those two websites veil of reality.com and that time of transition.com is on the main. Amazing. Bernard, thank you so much. I so appreciate all of your writings and musings and ramblings. It's it's awesome. Even on the ones that you may be projecting or whatever, if you're having have, a bad day, I, have, I don't I, I don't notice it so much. So it's, <laughs> it's it's great. I really appreciate what you have to say. So thank you for joining me, man. Thanks so much, Alex. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So many of us dream of buying some land, growing our own food, and becoming self-sufficient away from a society that's gone completely mad. What if it's easier than we think to make that dream a reality? Siblings Jamie and Shelby over at Living the Off-Grid Dream have cracked the code to getting land and living a life of freedom. They'll show you where to find land for $1 down, that's right, $1 down, 
with low monthly payments as well as how to structure your vision for a homestead, retreat center, regenerative farm, or community. It's one thing to have food, water, and land security, but it's an entirely different thing to have the financial security to buy the land and build it out in a way that aligns with your goals and aspirations. Their program teaches you how to make enough money on your land to cover all of your costs to make that happen. Plus, they've got you covered with pre-filled out plans to give you inspiration if you're not quite sure what your best move for your land is. And if you're a member of The Way Forward, you get a free one-on-one -on -one strategy call with Jamie and Shelby, as well as a free bonus gift. If you want to turn your homesteading, off-grid, or retreat center dreams into a reality, join Living the Off-Grid Dream by clicking the link in the show notes or heading to thewayforward.com forward slash off-grid. In nearly all cases with modern health systems, you're waiting months for appointments only to spend a mere 10 minutes with a doctor who quickly hands out a generic diagnosis that is likely rooted in a total misunderstanding of health and causes, and then you're offered a one-size-fits-all medication or invasive treatments with unpleasant side effects. If this sounds all too familiar, consider a different approach with the New Biology Clinic founded by Dr. Tom Cowan, a respected natural health doctor, author, and speaker. Dr. Cowan's holistic perspective on health and wellness and a deep understanding of the true nature of health and disease sets this clinic apart. With the new biology clinic, it's not about quick fixes and suppressing symptoms. The practitioners take time to understand your unique story, recognizing that health is unique to the individual and that illnesses have a variety of causes, physically and metaphysically. Members of the new biology clinic enjoy a flat monthly fee that includes a range of valuable services like health consults as needed, practitioner-led live streams on diverse health topics, access to a members-only resource library, and multiple live group sessions every month. These sessions cover fitness, breathing integration, biofield tuning, guided meditation, EFT tapping, and much more. Unlike traditional healthcare systems that thrive on frequent visits, prescriptions, treatments, and suppressing symptoms, the New Biology Clinic's motivation is to make you healthy and keep you that way. Visit newbiologyclinic.com to learn more and use code THEWAYFORWARD for $50 off your account activation. If you're a member of The Way Forward, email hello at thewayforward.com to receive $150 off your account activation. Your journey to genuine healing begins here.